All right, everyone, welcome to the Master Lease Option Masterclass, how to get your first small multifamily property in less than six months. Now, a little caveat to that, we can't control market conditions, but I can tell you from doing, um, oh goodness, over 20, uh, I think I'm at 22 videos now on YouTube. We're in our fifth week of the rental market, MSA rental market updates that um, the majority of the markets are declining. So they are heading towards finding opportunities. So that's a good thing for a lot of us. It's going to be a bad thing for the people holding right now, but we'll see how that all pans out. All right, but we're not here to talk about the rental market. We're here to talk about master lease options. So little disclaimer, I am not an attorney nor a CPA. I do not play one on TV or pretend to be one in real or imaginary life. This material is for educational purposes only and should not be considered advice. Consult your own attorney and or CPA for such advice. The reason I'm putting that up is because we will be talking about agreements uh, in this class today, and I don't want you to think that I'm giving you advice. It is for educational purposes only. You will always have an attorney draft your materials for you, okay? So that said, what are we going to cover tonight? Well, First, we're going to define what a master lease option is and then how a master lease option works. And the majority of this master class, because it's a fairly long process and it takes about 45 minutes or a little more than 45 minutes to get through how it works, there's just not enough time to dig deep into every single one of them, which is why I'm going to be doing the workshop starting next Saturday on the 25th so that we can dig deep into these strategies. So we'll be covering how a master lease option works, starting off with finding opportunities, then talking about how to underwrite the deal, how to negotiate the master lease and the option to purchase. Okay, so two different documents. We'll talk about both. Closing the deal, operating the property, and then exiting the master lease, whether you decide to exercise the option or just get out of both at that time, okay? I see a lot of people are putting their contact information in. That is great, okay? So real quick about me, <clears throat> this won't take long at all. I'm not gonna give you some big long sob story and tell you how I hit bottom and had this big epiphany and brought it back up and spend 20 minutes telling you all about me. We're not gonna do that. So I'm a multifamily investor and strategic consultant. I am a CCIM advanced market analysis instructor. I teach CI 102 for the Institute. I actually just got certified on Saturday as a certified distance education instructor by Arello. So new designation, I'm not gonna put it in the alphabet soup. Don't even ask me to. CCIM technology board, VP of marketing. So we have a tech board that runs site to do business. I'm the VP of marketing for that tech board. The CCIM Foundations board member, that is our capital raising arm. For veterans that are on this call, we just opened the veteran scholarship program applications last week, and we will be closing applications on March 23rd. So if you are a veteran or you're active duty and you are within 12 months of your end of active service, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to apply for the Veteran Scholarship Program. It will provide you with all the education you need to earn the CCIM designation or <clears throat> any other designation, and we'll pay up to $20,000 to get that done. When I did it, it cost me around fourteen dollars to $15,000, but I had to travel to Toronto to take my test. If I didn't have to travel to Toronto, it would have been less. So that 20,000 will literally pay for everything. Uh, Deshaun, just look up CCIM Foundation Scholarship Program and you'll find it. Uh, thank you, Tony. Appreciate that. I have talked to Tony earlier and gave it to him. I'm also the Ward Center Committee Chair for 2023, which is another education arm of the Institute. I'm founder of the Strategic Partnering Community. I'm a former syndicator and now passive investor. And I used to own a multifamily property management company. Enough about me. Quick caveat here. The CCIM Institute does not endorse this class. They do not even know this class is going on. This is all of my material. I just 
leverage everything I have around the CCIM Institute, which is why you see so much red and white happening around here. Okay. Just wanted to throw that little disclaimer out there. So what is a master lease option? Well, here is how uh, chat GPT defines it. And it was almost a perfect description. For those of you not using chat GPT, you need to look into that. So a master lease with an option to purchase is a type of lease agreement in which the tenant has the option to buy the property they are renting at a predetermined price within a specified time frame. This type of lease gives the tenant the ability to occupy and use the property as if they own it while also having the option to purchase the property in the future rather than having to purchase it immediately. So let's break that down for just a second. Um, it's a type of lease agreement in which the tenant has the option to buy the property they're renting at a predetermined price within a specified time frame. Okay, so that can either be a single family home, and I've done that, I've master leased a single family home, or it can be multiple units. Now, it can be multiple multifamily units, it can be multiple mobile home park units, it can be multiple retail units, multiple office units, multiple industrial units. It doesn't matter. This works in any type of real estate, okay? What you have to be careful of is how large the property is. This would not be a good strategy for a 150 unit apartment complex. I'd never recommend that, okay? As a matter of fact, you're gonna see in just a second, the number of units I do recommend, a minimum and a maximum, and there's a reason for both, all right? So this type of lease gives the tenant the ability to occupy, occupy and use the property as if they own it. So when you have a master lease agreement, you're basically subordinating all of the leases that are currently on the property. So the owner is the lessor and all those tenants are the lessees. When you come in with a master lease, you're subordinating all the lessees to your master lease. And so, so there's a, some agreements that have to get put in place in order for that to be legal. And we'll talk about that. Okay. So that is what a master lease option is. So how in the world does it work? Well, first we got to find an opportunity, okay? Now, if you've taken my strategic partnering workshop, you would know that I do not start with finding the opportunity. As a matter of fact, we don't talk about finding an opportunity until module five, okay? We got to set some goals. We got to build some relationships. We got to find our market. You know, then we go find an opportunity. But here, because we can start in our local market and that we're starting with smaller properties, that we can go out into the marketplace right now and start identifying opportunities where a master lease option might fit. Now, you're not going to get an owner on the phone and you're going to say, hey, you know, this is David Monroe with Premier Apartment Services. Um, you look into master lease your property, they're going to just click, hang up. You can't do that, okay? You've got to ask some questions and do some other things. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So, Five to no more than 50 units. Who can tell me why five units is my bottom number here? Julie, you're not allowed to answer this question. Is that because it's still considered commercial? So five units are not considered commercial, but the loan is considered commercial. Multifamily, okay, for those of you that have this misconception that five or more units is a commercial property in multifamily, that is not true. Here's how I can prove it. Who can tell me what the depreciation schedule is for a commercial property? How many years? How many years can we depreciate a commercial property? Is it 37 and a half? No, it's 39. 39. Okay. okay. 39 years. How many years can we depreciate a residential property? 27 and a half. 27 and a half. If you have a 100 unit apartment complex, how many years do we depreciate a 100 unit apartment complex? Nobody wants to answer. 27, 27, and, 27 and a half. That's correct. Okay. That tells you that the government has defined apartment complexes as residential. The only thing that brings commercial to the table is your loan. That's when you go 
to Miss Julianne Peterson that is on this call and you say, Julie, I got a 10 unit. I need a loan. And she'll help you with that as long as it's over a million dollars in debt. Okay. Um, any other classification for apartments, I don't care if it's an a thousand unit apartment complex, it's residential. All right. So let's just clear that air. That, that drives me nuts. People call it commercial multifamily. No, it still depreciates on a residential schedule. By government definition, it is residential. All right. So five, the reason we go five or more units is because residential loans have all kind. When I say residential, one to four units, that's a residential loan. They have all kinds of rules and regulations associated with them. We don't want to have to deal with any of that. Now, if you want to deal with that, you can. Like I said, I have master leased a single family home. You just have to be careful when you do, because there are rules and regulations and stipulations to protect the consumers for residential loans. Commercial loans are a bit more forgiven. So, um, or commercial properties are a bit more forgiving. So, uh, when we're doing five units or more, even though we're still residential, when we go to buy this big bad boy, um, we're going to be getting a commercial loan because it's five or more units. So we don't have to deal with some of those regulations that you have with the residential uh, requirements. All right. So that's why five is the minimum. 50 is the maximum because you want to keep this under um, a property that would require on-site management. This strategy works for off-site management, not on-site management. We're getting real complicated when we start to do that. 50 may even be too much in some markets. Like in Miami, I wouldn't go to 50 units. I might only go to 20 units in Miami. I might only go to 16 units in California. It just depends on where you are as to what this could be. Really, the sweet spot is between 10 and 20 units for doing this strategy, okay? Um, and it's because it's where you're going to find some of the opportunities. The owners are a little less sophisticated on current strategies. They probably own the properties longer, and they're just tired. They're wore out, and they're not really wanting to deal with these things anymore, you know, maybe they got a loan on them later on and um, they owe too much and can't sell it right now, whatever the case is. They just don't want to deal with it anymore or they've been uh, managing it themselves, didn't think they could hire a property management company and, and it's just running them into the ground and they're just tired of it. Okay. So, or you've got some kids that inherited it and don't want to deal with it. Uh, can't really sell it maybe because they think it's priced. Anyway, there's all kinds of different ways we can negotiate to figure out whether this strategy will work or not. But we have to we have to start doing some things first. So here's where we create and execute a marketing plan. And the reason why I have REI skip, skip in parentheses is you've got to have leads. You need owner leads wherever you get them from. Because we're working under 50 units, you can't go to a broker that has Yardi Matrix or Reese um, or Axiometrics, which are all really good data providers for multifamily assets because they're only 50 or more units. They don't go under 50 units. The only ones that go under 50 units are CoStar. Now you can get ownership data from Prospect Now and from Reonomy, but you don't get analytic data with those two software. So I 100% of the time we'll recommend CoStar, at least for now, in multi, excuse me, in the multifamily space, because they are the only ones that will go all the way to two units and provide analytics between two and 50 units. And in every single market in the country where everybody else for analytics is only in the top 135 markets. Okay. And again, you're not going to get analytics from uh from uh Reonomy and Prospect Now. Now, Crexy claims they have analytics. Yeah, no, they don't. It's not the same. It's not even remotely close. So don't come to me and say, hey, I'm using Crexy for analytics. It's not going to work out. Crexy does not track rents for apartments. They just don't. They track leases on commercial properties, 
but they do not track rents for apartments. So be very careful getting sold by Crexy on data for apartments, All right? CoStarOwnsApartments.com, which is why I go to that source for my data and the fact they go under 50 units. The other thing is, um, what's the big acquisition story right now in the marketplace for CoStar? Who are they trying to, what, what website are they trying to buy right now? Does anybody know? Is it Realtor.com? It is Realtor.com, which means if they can go through with that and the government allows them to do it, and I don't see why they wouldn't considering um, NAR owns Realtor.com and they are the lobbyists that would stop this from happening, um, we're going to get single family data. That's huge. That is absolutely huge for CoStar because it is, it is the one piece of information we lack are the analytics for single family rentals. So I'm so looking forward to that. So we have to find leads back to create and execute the marketing plan. We got to find leads. Where are we going to get those leads? Well, from all those different sources I just mentioned. For me, it's CoStar. For all my strategic partnering members in my community, those leads are already in the members area. And then you can go to REI Skip to skip trace email addresses, phone numbers, things like that. I ran across this uh, software uh, a week or so ago, and I absolutely love it. It, I went and I took some CoStar data and I threw it in REI Skipped, and it produced incredible results. Okay, and we're gonna, I'm gonna go through and walk everybody through REI Skip when we get into the workshop uh, a week from Saturday. So next, we have to identify the opportunity actually exists. So we do this by asking good questions. So once we have a conversation going with an owner, whether it's through direct message, whether it's through text message, whether it's on the phone, through a Zoom call, however we're doing it, okay, we got to start asking really good questions. And this is where we're starting to drill down and find out does a master lease with option to purchase exist for this asset. If you start talking about, hey, you know, we're in the market, we're investors, we have experience in, you know, 20 to 40 units, and this is a 32 unit apartment complex. And um, we're in the business of um, finding solutions for owners that um, are having problems uh, either with their residence or their property. Uh, or their marketing plan, or, 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 you know, if the owner responds back, yeah, you know, I'd sell it, yeah, if I could, you know, get $3 million for it. Well, that's probably not an opportunity. So by asking questions, we can drill down to see if we have an opportunity. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to flush out that owner's pain. Ask questions that will draw it out, you know, um, how how were you affected by COVID? Did your residents pay? Did you get the PPP plan or whatever the heck that stupid thing was called? Did the government ever reimburse? You know, were the tenants paying when they were getting reimbursed by the government? Have you recovered from that? It's things that will flush out where that pain's coming from. If you've driven the property and you've seen it <clears throat> and you see that it's run down, you can start asking questions about... Um, Hey, I've got a, a really good roof contractor that I can give you information on. I noticed that you've got some shingles sliding off one of the roofs on building B um, when I was driving around the neighborhood the other day. Um, do you want his contact information? That may start to flush out a little bit of that pain. So that's how we identify whether that opportunity actually exists or not. So once we have an opportunity, we've got to start to underwrite the deal. So we're going to underwrite this thing as if we're buying it today. Okay. Now I know that a lot of you have been listening to the gurus and you'll always see me do this when I say gurus on how to underwrite properties. If you underwrite a property the way you were taught by a guru, you will not do any deals with master lease options. What you need to do is underwrite it as if it was, uh, as if the financials were for today. So you get a current rent roll and a current P&L. If you can get a T12, great, but most properties at this level aren't going to have T12s. 
Owner's going to look at you sideways if you ask for a T12. That's the kind of owner we want. So uh, a previous 12-month P&L and uh, a year-to-date P&L is really all we need and that current rent roll. And we can start to underwrite it for that specific financials, not what it can be. We don't care what it can be. What is it right now? All right. And we're going to determine a value. So when we start to negotiate our purchase price for this, we're purchasing it as if the financials are today, we're purchasing it in the future. Okay. That's why it's really important that you use good underwriting fundamentals for today's numbers, not the future. So using the fundamental assumptions for those of you that have heard me talk before about underwriting or have gone through the strategic partnering workshop or the underwriting workshop or the underwriting case study, I like to teach underwriting. I don't know what to tell you. Um, you'll know the six assumptions are what are current market rents? What's your vacancy assumption? What is your income growth assumption, your expense growth assumption, your interest rate assumption that you can get on the loan? And then what is your exit cap rate or your refi cap rate if you're getting short-term debt? Now, if you're getting short-term debt today, you need to rethink your acquisition strategy because everybody that got short-term debt in 2021 is about to find out how much trouble they're in. Mark my words on that one. All right, so we're not really looking for debt right now, but these are the assumptions. We'll look at debt later on when we get ready to purchase this thing, if we decide to exercise the option. But we got to use those fundamental principles and those assumptions. So you got to kind of do a market analysis to draw those assumptions out so that we can do a good, solid financial underwriting. Then we need to determine the business plan. So we look at the property. We've got an idea of what we can pay for it now. And we, we visit the property. Do not ask to go into every single unit. You are not in due diligence. If there's a vacant unit or two, ask to see a vacant unit or two. The owner will show you some vacant units. Do not go into an occupied unit. You'll have plenty of time to see the occupied units later. Look at the structure. Look at the landscape. Look at the curb appeal. Um, let me ask this question. When... You guys go to purchase a home or um, or look at uh, a single family residence. What is the number one thing you're looking at as you drive up to that property? Curb appeal. Curb appeal, right? Do you think it's any different for a resident that's going to live in an apartment community? No. No, it's not. Okay. I was a career renter for a long time. I've lived in a lot of apartment complexes. And if I started to drive up to the property and it was run down, I never pulled in the parking lot. I kept right on going, okay? Even if I had an appointment, there was no way I was gonna pull into that area. So curb appeal is huge. So we can start to focus in our mind, what are we gonna do to this property? We're not raising capital to bring a big capital infusion into this like you would in a normal acquisition. Remember, this is a master lease option. And when we get into negotiation, you'll find out why I'm saying this. So you need to figure out what can you do over the next 12 months that you can improve this asset from the cash flow that you're going to receive from this property. And by looking at the P&L and looking at the rent roll, you can start to see efficiencies. So you'll know whether you can increase rents as lease expires or if it's got very low occupancy as you're renting units, you'll get more NOI coming in and you'll see operational efficiencies where you could start to lower operating expenses. When you start to identify that, now things start coming together so that when it comes to negotiating, you've got a good idea of where to go with your LOI, which is the next step. So negotiate the opportunity. No different. We still submit an LOI. You don't have to. It just opens the conversation. Does anybody know what an LOI was originally created for? A letter of intent? Why did letter of, because it's a non-binding agreement. So why do we need a non-binding agreement in commercial real estate? To negotiate the official PSA or contract without spending a ton of money and time. That's why we do it now. But what was it originally designed for? Leases. 
Contract attorneys love leases and they will spend as much time as they possibly can drafting it. So the LOI was created to get the terms, price and terms done so that the attorneys had a document to work from to speed the process up. Now we use it to open the communication, okay? But LOIs were never meant to purchase. LOIs were meant for starting the process and narrowing down what the price and terms were for attorneys on leases. A lot of people don't know that. So we got to negotiate two things. First thing we're going to negotiate is the master lease. Remember I said in the beginning, they're two separate documents. Yeah, exactly. Two completely separate documents, all right? So we're going to ma negotiate the master lease first because without the master lease, the next one is irrelevant. Now it says one to five years. Why, why would we only negotiate a one-year master lease? What's the thought process there? Thank you guys for being interactive with me. It gives it you better. a chance to improve on some of your business plan in the year so you can go and refi or purchase the property based upon those uh, current financials. Too, too soon to purchase. We need three years before we purchase. If you don't believe me, ask Julie. Lenders want to see three years of financials. There's a method to my madness. Stand by, we'll get there. But that's not why I have the number one here. Arun, uh, nope, that wasn't it. What if your business plan isn't working? Do you want a way out or do you want to be stuck in a three to five year lease? Want a way out. You want a way out, right? That's why that number one is there. When I do this, I want a one-year lease. I'm going to ask for a three-year option agreement, but I want a one-year lease because I want the ability to get out of this thing if it's eaten me alive. There's always going to be that possibility. Okay. Oh, okay, Arun. Good. So one to five years, it's up to you. If you want to be locked into a three to five-year lease, totally up to you. I would highly recommend every year renegotiating the lease. And you can do, if you're going to do a three-year option agreement, you can negotiate a one-year lease with two one-year extensions to get you to that three-year. That way uh, you've got something in writing that can get you there. Uh, so the master lease. What amount are we trying to get for our rental rate? Well, there's a minimum and a maximum. The minimum amount is going to be the loan amount. Remember, this needs to be a win-win situation. We're trying to solve a problem for the owner. The owner's in pain. And we're trying to curb that pain. So this needs to be a win-win. So it needs to be a win-win for the owner and it needs to be a win-win for us. So by not going under the loan amount so that that loan still gets paid, the owner wins. By staying under the current NOI, then we win. Because if you negotiate the lease amount over the current NOI, where's the additional money coming from? Until you get the NOI up, it's coming out of your pocket. So this is our minimum and our maximum, and you can negotiate it anywhere in between. The goal is to get it for the loan amount. But you never negotiate a master lease above the current net operating income. Keeping in mind that it's going to take a little bit of time to start to raise that NOI. So you may be working for free for two or three months until that starts to happen. So you've got to pay attention to that. Next, we have to negotiate the option to purchase. Once we've come to a meeting of minds for that lease, now we have to negotiate the option to purchase. And now it's three to five years. So lenders, when you go to a lender for a loan, the first thing they ask you is, I want to see the last three years financials. Well, guess what? If you've been operating the property for the last three years, it's almost like a refi. It's not a refi, but they start to treat it a little differently 
because you've been operating the property. You have a master lease. And we'll talk about this later that you're going to record with the county. And you have this option of purchase that you're going to record with the county that shows you have operated this property as if you were the owner for the last three years and you provide them with the T12 and you provide them with the rent rolls and you provide them with everything they need in order to get a loan. That's why we do three to five years because they're going to ask for a minimum of three years. Uh, Julie, have you ever asked for any less than three years? Never. Never. Okay, that's why. That's why we negotiate the master lease to one year in case the business plan isn't working and we can get out. And that's why we negotiate the option to purchase at a minimum of three years. Okay. Um, you're going to negotiate at today's value. So you're going to take the current NOI and you're going to divide it by today's cap rate and you're going to come up with today's uh, value. You're going to utilize, I wouldn't go to CoStar and get the market cap rate off of CoStar because it's delayed probably two or three quarters. I would see what the interest rates on loans are today, and I'd go 100 basis points above that so you can assure positive leverage. So if interest rates are at 6.5%, and for those of you who don't know, Freddie Mac right now is 6.12 for 30-year fixed. So if you go 100 basis points above that, then you can do a 7.12% cap rate on the current NOI of the property. And as long as you communicate all that to the owner and say, here is what I value the property, I'm willing to pay market price for as it sits today. Probably isn't going to do a whole lot of negotiating with you. It's probably going to like the number. And he says, okay, that looks good to me. Now, that gives you three years if the business plan is working to grow that NOI, that business plan, get that business plan working, get those rents up, get the expenses down, get those efficiencies in. Uh, let's see, in a master lease, who takes care of CapEx, big expenses such as HVAC, roof, et cetera? So Akash, it can be negotiated, but if you're negotiating to the uh, loan amount, you're going to be responsible for all of that. If you're negotiating to the NOI, then I'd start negotiating a minimum amount that, or a maximum amount that you're responsible for, and then that the owner will be responsible for beyond that. Um, does that make sense? That way you've, you've got some room. If you're negotiated your master lease to the loan amount, there's no room for the owner other than out of their own pocket for CapEx. Vice versa, if it's negotiated up to the current NOI, there's no room for you to negotiate for CapEx. Now we're going to tell the owner, look, you know, you've got all this cushion in here, so we need to put some aside for CapEx. And just like anything else, you're going to want to put money away for capital expenditures and I'd even say, if you're smart, you're going to start escrowing a certain amount of money so that you have a down payment when you're ready to get a loan when you go to purchase this thing so that no money comes out of your pocket. If you're smart, we'll talk about that when we get ready to exit this thing, okay? So we're going to negotiate it to today's price based on today's cap rate on today's interest rate. So again, 6.12 is Freddie Mac, 30-year fixed right now. So I would negotiate it at 7.12 divided by the NOI. Uh, what's to keep the owner from ending the relationship uh, you've bought the property up in value? You're going to have an option to purchase. Now, who knows what type of agreement an option to purchase is? Is it a uh, bilateral agreement or is it a unilateral agreement? Unilateral, right? That's correct. And what does that mean, Mario? That I, as the buyer, have the option, but the seller is already committed. The seller is committed. It is no different, Kurt, than having a purchase agreement for three years in place. Same thing. Okay. But David, would you would you already have a purchase price in place? Yes. Or the purchase price is built into the option to purchase. I'm I am going to give an option agreement at today's value. Now, 
They may try to negotiate it a little higher. That's up to you. The goal is to get it at today's value. So in three years, you're purchasing it at, to, at today's value, not three years from now. And there's if they agree to it and they sign it, because you're, you're going to record it. And you're going to record it to protect you three years in, in the future and give you equitable interest in the property. Okay, that's why we record these. Because you're not going to do this at a normal closing table. You're just going to have an, an attorney draft up some documents and you're going to get them signed and notarized. And then you're going to record them. Okay, I always recommend you still get a uh, title search done, but you've got three years to clear those clouds on the title because you're not purchasing for three years. Maybe even up to five, depends. I try to get extensions just in case because you don't know what the market's going to do three years from now. So I always try to get two extensions, which is why I say three to five. Does that make sense, Akash? Yep. Okay, so unilateral agreement means that the seller is bound by the contract. The buyer is not. The buyer can get out at any time. All they have to do is submit a release to option agreement. That's it. And that gets them out. They are not bound by the contract, but the owner is. What are we going to put down for option consideration? How much money are we putting down? Anyone? Why? Why? Why put anything down? A hundred bucks. Why put anything down? We it need, so you have to have shows. consideration, right? Yeah. You're entering a master lease agreement. Is that master lease not consideration? You're paying the owner on a monthly basis for the next 12 months. Is Hello, that David. not consideration? Permission to come in here. Hi, my name is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Uh, we're, we're talking about a, a typical lease agreement at the end of the day. And, um, you know, the, the owner is protected by virtue of the fact that he actually has a lease agreement with you. Why option consideration or earnest money wouldn't come into because it doesn't really uh, constitute an actual sale. The only thing that would come into play here would be the possibility of, of offering a security deposit. But then again, why would you do that? As you quite correctly point out, there's there's no need for anything like that because the owner is, is nowhere is he at risk at this point in time. That's correct. Um, but there is, uh, there is um, cases where people do put earnest money down for that option consideration. It becomes non-refundable um, and it could be any negotiated amount, but Right. Again, if, he, if he wants to sweeten the deal, for instance, in yeah, some yeah. Ways. If you want right. to sweeten right. the deal, sure. Yeah. Um, but again, you're you're putting a master lease in place. So what makes a contract legal? Again, I'm not an attorney, but from my understanding, you must have some kind of financial consideration to that contract to make it legal, which is why you'll see like $10 on uh on a um a mortgage you guys ever noticed that you ever seen a mortgage and it says uh for consideration of ten dollars it's because there has to be some form of value in order to make the contract legal well that's what the master lease does for us that is a valuable asset to the owner because they're going to receive income from us for the next six months uh, for the next year so that is our consideration. So we don't need earnest money. And that's kind of how you explain it to them in the negotiation. I hope that all makes sense. Anybody confused on that? That's how you get into these deals with no money out of your pocket. Good. All right. So next, we've negotiated. We got our master lease in place. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Selling your car to your sister for 10 bucks. Um, now we got to get some documents signed. So what documents do we need to get signed? We do not have to go to a title company to do this. So we don't need to pay a closing fee or anything else. I would still recommend getting a title search done uh, and paying for a title search, but you don't need to get an official closing done. You can have any uh, notary execute these um, or notarize these documents so that you can record them. 
Master lease agreement, obviously, we've talked about that considerably, and option to purchase agreement. Both of these get recorded with the county, as well as an assignment of leases. Now, this is one that a lot of people forget. And then they go to court to evict somebody, and the judge says, you don't look like Jorge Rodriguez. What's your name, son? David Monroe, sir. Um, this isn't your lease. You're not the lessor. Jorge Rodriguez is. Oh, he was the previous owner, sir. Hmm, where's your assignment of leases? What gives you the right to this lease? Well, it was in the purchase agreement, sir. Uh-uh. The owner has the right to those leases, not you. And you don't know that until you go to court and try to evict a resident. And not every judge will do that, but there is case law to show that if a judge is trying to protect a resident, even in a landlord-friendly state, they will almost always go to the assignment of leases. So you always want to ask in every transaction you do when you're purchasing a rental property to get an assignment of leases, all right? But we need to do an, a, some additional because we have to subordinate all of the existing leases to our master lease. So not only do you need an assignment of all the existing leases, you also need an, a, a document that each and every single resident that's currently in the property signs that subordinates their lease to your lease, pretty much becoming sub-tenants. Does that make sense to everybody? That is very important. You cannot skip that step. And again, that assignment of leases gets recorded with the county. Those are the three things you want to record. Next is an assignment of option agreement. Now you can put a clause in your uh, option agreement where it is assignable so that any time in that three to five year period, you can assign that option to another buyer. And you can either get it with owner approval or without owner of approval. You can do it on a separate assignment of option agreement, or you can just put it as a clause inside your option agreement that you have recorded. Totally up to you how you do it. We'll talk about how to execute that when we get to exiting the deal. And then, of course, you want to record the master lease, the option to purchase agreement, and all the assignment of leases. I kind of missed putting the option agreement in there. It's very important you record that option, okay? That option agreement is what gives you equitable interest into that property. And you're going to need that when you go to exit the deal in order to be treated a little bit differently when it comes to getting that loan when you go to purchase this asset if you decide to get a loan. But we're going to talk about how to purchase this with seller financing. So now we got to operate the property. So we have our documents in place. Our master lease is in place. Everything's recorded. It's time to go and operate the property. What's the first thing we're going to do before we do anything else? What do we need in place? Off-site management. Higher property management. You're not going to operate this yourself. If you have experience operating properties and you've been a property manager and you want to do it yourself, fine. That's up to you. I don't ever recommend it. You want to make sure when you're doing your underwriting that you price in 10% for offsite management. 10%, not six, not eight, 10%. You get what you pay for. Pay attention, there might be a quiz later. I ran an offsite property management company. The margins are the thinnest in the industry. Restaurants have bigger margins than offsite management companies. If you want this property operated properly, you price in 10% of the income, gross operating income. Okay? Don't argue with me on that. Just do it. You also you have to open that? your bank accounts. Go Excuse ahead. me, Dave. Can you do that if the current owner does not actually have a property management company. If you're going to add 10%, you're going to throw your numbers out, won't you? Well, we're going to price it in. Okay. It's going to be in our underwriting. We're going to price that right in. Okay. If we're getting it at the loan amount, then it shouldn't be an issue. 
If it is, it's probably not close enough to be able to do an option agreement, a master lease with option. We got to have enough spread where we can price in our operational efficiencies. We're going to find other ways to reduce, but you got to be able to take that 10% hit right off the bat. There's a good chance that the owner may have property management in place already, but they're really crappy and they just don't want to go through the process of trying to fire them and hire somebody else and do it in between interim. And that may be part of their pain. So all you have to do is uh, negotiate being able to fire them as soon as you take over and boom, let them go, get your people in place and, and keep moving. When you're opening bank accounts, you got to be careful here. Some management companies are going to want to open the bank accounts in their name. That's okay. I did the same thing as a management company. I would open the bank accounts in my company's name. Uh, yes, this is being recorded. Um, you made me think a minute. Oh, did I, for, did I forget to hit the record button? I did. It's recording. Um, even when I managed properties, my management company would open the bank accounts for the property. That's fine, but you're going to want to make sure that you are uh, listed as a signature and owner on the account. Because if you fire that property management company, you've got to be able to get access to those funds. If you're not a signature on the account, you don't have control over what happens. Doesn't mean they're going to take the money and run, but they may hold it for a little while and that can hurt. So they may try to make it a little painful because you're firing them. So just make sure that you're a signature and listed as owner on the account and you'll be fine. You're also going to want to have two accounts. You're going to want to have an operating account and an escrow account. Who could tell me why we need an escrow account? Rent deposits. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't ever commingle your rents and your operating account ever or your uh, deposits in your operating account ever. That is the number one uh, infraction that um, real estate attorneys go after is commingling. Uh, John, there will be a copy of the recording sent out in the morning. All right, so those are the bank accounts. Now we got to just execute our business plan. We put one in place when we started this process. We, we always purchase with the end in mind. Now we just got to execute that business plan. So whatever we thought we could increase rents to, Maybe it was really low occupancy and we decided we were going to go a little lower on rent in order to fill up those occupant spaces or those uh, vacant spaces so that we can occupy them and get more income coming in right off the bat. This allows us to start to build up some capital expense money right away. The other thing we can do is we can start to improve operating efficiencies. So if it's an old property built in the 60s or 70s, good chance that there's a master meter for water. The owner might even be paying all the electric. So can you implement some kind of ratio utility billing system where you're billing back to the resident the utilities? Caveat here, never bill more than you're being billed for. If you get caught profiting on billing back utilities, um, that will be a bad deal. Okay, do not do not do that. I don't know what the penalty is. I don't know what the fine is. Um, I just know it is illegal to profit from doing a rubs. Do not do that. Uh, just do it the way uh, you're supposed to do it. What I like to do is determine how many units I have. What is the, the average bill? And you can look over the last 12 months or two years. You can see what the average bill is. Divide it by the number of units subtract one unit for common areas, and then that becomes, uh, and then divide it, divide that by the total, well, sorry, take the total amount that's been averaged, get the total number of units, subtract one, divide that number by that average bill, and that's what you bill to the tenants. Just be careful that you don't ever overbill. Nobody ever questions that kind of strategy. It's just a flat fee. The, the residents like it because they know how much it's going to be every single month. So that's what I did when I was operating. And then lowering expenses. Where can we lower expenses? Uh, so you'll have to look around and see from the P&L where, you know, maybe trash is really stinking high compared to the market. 
So maybe it's just a matter of getting a different trash company in there to lower that expense. There's some things you're not going to be able to lower, you know, property taxes or property taxes, insurance. You're not going to be able to have uh, the ability to do insurance because you don't own the property yet. You're only master leasing it. So uh, the owner will be uh, the insured, but you definitely want to get uh added as additionally insured on the insurance policy. Make sure you do that. I should have put that in here and I didn't. I'm glad I mentioned that. Okay. So there are ways to lower expenses. So we're there's just nothing like, stopping you from requesting from the owner to see if you can shop around for cheaper insurance or even do that for him. Correct. Right? You can. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that, but the owner has to agree to that. Absolutely. Yeah. The other but, the big killer now, of course, in expenses, your snow removal. That's always an unpredictable one. Well, I, I live in the Southeast. We don't have that problem. Uh, <laughs> I actually got a little sweat on me right now. I got 75 degrees today. Okay. All right. So now it's time to exit this thing. So let's say we just want to exit. First thing we got to do is exit the master lease. And then we have to exit the option agreement, whether we're executing the option or we decide to release the option either way. So first we're going to talk about exiting the master lease. So you can exercise the option to purchase. When you exercise the option to purchase, that will cancel the master lease because now you own the property. Okay, so that automatically cancels that master lease. That's one way to do it. You can assign that master lease. That master lease has value. If you get to a point where you decide that you don't want to move forward with purchasing this asset, but you see the value and you've brought the NOI up, you can assign the master lease at its current master lease rate. That's got a lot of value. You could put a cap rate to that. And so you can now assign this master lease to somebody else so that they can come in and execute their plan moving forward or take your plan that you were executing, especially if it was working and let them take it from there. Or if things aren't working, which is why we only go one year at a time, you can exit the master lease when it expires. Things aren't working. I need to get out of this thing. What the hell was I thinking? And you just exit the master lease at expiration. At that point, you would also um, release the option agreement as not uh, taking the option. You're giving it up. So you'd let the owner know at that point. And then the owner has to take over. But they get to keep all those operating efficiencies you put in place. So they'll have a little bit of a smile on their face. As long as you don't go backwards with it, It'll be okay. All right, so let's say we're not going to purchase the property, okay? So now we're exiting the lease option or the option agreement. Well, we need a release of that option agreement. So we have to send in to the owner that we are releasing the option agreement. We are not going to exercise the option. We're releasing the option. Um, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Nice doing business with you. Here's this beautiful property that we've managed to do over the last two years. This just isn't for me. Okay. Or you can assign the option agreement. Again, it has value, especially if you've brought the NOI up and at, at you know, say two years from now, you're exiting this thing uh, and you don't want to purchase it. If you've brought the NOI up, say 30, 40%, that's huge value you've added. There's value to that. You can sell that to somebody else. And again, just like what we talked about in the beginning, you can get an assignment with owner approval or an assignment without owner approval. We don't ever recommend without owner approval. Again, we want this to be a win-win situation. And trust me, the owner does not want to take back over ownership of this property. Um, so you're probably going to get that owner approval pretty easily uh, once they qualify that, that next person. All right. So this is basically a wholesale at the exit. So you're wholesaling your master lease and your option agreement to somebody else. You're just not doing it in you know a two or three month period. You operated this property for a while and now you're exiting it and wholesaling it to the next person that will continue that business plan on that master lease with the option to purchase. Or they can just decide to purchase the asset at that point. So the amount depends on the agreement and the current NOI. Now, let me ask this. That brings up a good point. If you found a buyer, now there's going to be risk to this, but if you found a buyer 
that was interested in purchasing your master lease option, but they had the ability to actually close on it that day or put in a purchase agreement to close on it at that point and not do the master lease agreement. How could you benefit from that? Would you have to close on it yourself and resell it, David? Purchase it. Yep. So you at this point, you would execute your uh, right to purchase. Yeah. You'd purchase the property and then you'd put it under contract for the new purchase amount for the other person. Again, there's risk to that because what if the other person doesn't buy? Now you're stuck with that property. Okay. So yeah, that is one way you can do it. So I just wanted to bring that up because as I was talking about that, that triggered in my brain um, to mention that. So there, if you're trying to wholesale it and they say, well, hey, we just like to purchase it now, execute the option agreement, purchase the property, and then turn around and uh, put it under contract for the new amount. Keep the rest. So the amount depends on the agreement and current NOI, obviously. So what if we're going to purchase the property? Well, it's a good thing to escrow some cash flow for a down payment. So if you've negotiated your master lease to the loan amount, and let's say it's a 10-unit property, and you're cash flowing $1,000 a month from the property at current NOI when you start the master lease, If you escrow 50% of that, 25% for capital expenses and 25% for future down payment, you're going to do very well with this asset. Begin with the end in mind. That should be part of your business plan. Everybody's going to get the recording, Cheyenne. Don't worry about it. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Now, as you improve, your cash flow is going to get more and more and more every month as you do improvements and bring more people into the property and raise rents, raise occupancy. So I'd stay with that 25 and 25%. Half of your cash flow before tax every month should go to 25% to capital expenses um, reserves and 25% to purchase down payment reserves. If you cannot uh get a loan but if this has been a 3 year deal and it makes it a little easier when you've been operating the property for 3 years to go to the lender bring them a beautiful T12 a beautiful rent roll a beautiful business plan on what you're going to do in the future how you've operated it up to this point the little that the owner has done during the last 3 years and you're just going to look gorgeous to that lender. You just eliminated a whole lot of risk to that lender. Julie, am I lying? I don't know if she's still here. I think Julie. I'm left. here. I'm here. Oh, I'm am here. I lying? <laughs> that is true. Right? Absolutely. So that's why I say three years. It helps you to get that loan. You're still getting a new loan. You still have to qualify. It just makes it an easier decision for the lender. Okay. That's that's the goal there. If the owner won't give you seller financing. But for the last three years, you've made your payment every single month, month after month after month. And if you've negotiated in between the loan amount and the NOI, the owner has been getting a little additional cash flow, almost, actually passive income. Obviously, the loan amount's got to go to the lender, but any difference is going in their pocket. That's passive income. They've been enjoying that for the last three years. Would there be a situation where you think they'd want to stop? So the seller continues to receive monthly cash flow. Now they're actually getting more monthly cash flow. They're no longer responsible for paying the loan. Now they are the lender. And they're getting monthly cash flow every single month. And it starts to become really attractive to get this passive income. So it becomes really easy to negotiate 
seller financing when you get to that exit point and you want to exercise that option. So sorry, Julie, but then we don't need you at that point. Okay. So now you own a multifamily property as a single owner with no money out of your pocket, no partners or investors to split the cash flow with. Does that not make it a much more attractive situation than being in some stupid syndication where you've got 20 freaking people involved and nobody makes any money until the very end? That's see to me, that's crazy. This is a completely different situation. All right. Now, caveat here is you got to have a little bit of experience in either asset management or property management. You don't want to try to do this with no experience. So if you don't have experience, find somebody who does partner with them and both of you go into a deal like this. Okay. That's how you make money with a master lease option. So what are your next steps? So you want to pick a market, no more than three. If you come to me and I ask you, what market are you in? And you tell me the Southeast, I'm going to tell you to go away. You don't know what you're doing. Okay. You've got to have one to three markets to work in. What you're looking for is you're looking for 400 to 750 owners that you can market to in your marketing plan. What that does is it leaves room for follow-up. If you're just marketing to every single property in the Southeast, you're never going to have an opportunity to follow up and the money is in the follow-up. Anybody that knows anything about sales knows the money is in the follow-up. You have to have room. So no more than three. You, what you're looking for is 400 to 750 owners that you can market to on a consistent basis. If you're doing this right, you should be touching every single owner in your three markets or one to three markets every quarter. You should be touching them every quarter. Locals best, no matter where you live. I don't care if you live in Los Angeles. I don't know if George is on here or not. Uh, oh, uh, Georgia is on here. Georgia lives in LA. Um, locals best, even if you live in Southern California, Georgia. So you want to create that marketing plan and execute it. Uh, I'm going to be doing Nashville for my rental, my MSA rental market analysis this week. Stay tuned for that. Then go out and identify those master lease option opportunities from uh, executing that marketing plan, get it under contract, get your lease agreement in place, execute the business plan, make more money than someone syndicating 100 plus unit deals and enjoy consistent and predictable monthly cash flow.